Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our third and final panel on Africa's post-pandemic economic recovery. Uh, we have a really exceptional group of panelists who will help to address Africa's current economic and social challenges and some of the issues that uh, may arise with regard to U.S. policy and U.S. interactions with countries in the region. Um, we're going to focus on economic issues in the current period. COVID and the pandemic and the economic and social dislocations certainly dominate current discussion, uh, but the pandemic arrives in a context of slower growth in recent years, dampened by lower commodity prices, declining growth in China, and rising debt commitments. So there's a context here that goes well beyond the immediate day-to-day -day concerns with uh, coronavirus and the, the global pandemic, as important as that is. Following two decades of rising growth across much of the region, with the most intensive episode in the early 2000s, countries across Africa have faced more limited prospects in recent years. Structural transformation remains an aspiration rather than an achievement for most countries, and so that is an important frontier. How to translate growth into change in the productive and livelihood structure uh, of African economies. More recently, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has slowed global trade and required costly lockdowns in a number of countries. And although African states have so far mostly been spared the worst depredations of the virus, the economic and social costs in poor economies have been heavy, as we mentioned at the outset. Today's panelists will discuss economic prospects for African countries as we anticipate a, a subsiding health crisis, and we'll, we'll, we will also consider possible roles for the U.S. in relating to the new economies of the region. So I'm going to uh, ask our panelists to uh, budget about 10 minutes for your initial comments, uh, and then we can move on from there. We'll have a conversation, and we can entertain some time uh, for Q and A. Let me uh, introduce the panelists uh, as they are uh, listed, I believe, in the program. Uh, I'll double check that. I don't want to uh, get cause any confusion. Um, yes, this is good. Um, let me begin with uh, Dr. Zainab Usman, uh, Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Program at uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, DC. Her fields of expertise include institutions, economic policy, energy policy, and emerging economies in Africa. Her forthcoming book, a, a, a hotly anticipated book, um, for those of us who have read uh, drafts and uh, earlier statements. Uh, Economic Diversification in Nigeria, The Politics of Building a Post-Oil Economy, is set to be published by Zed Bloomsbury in November 2021, and we eagerly await uh, the appearance of that uh, statement. I think it's going to be a very, very important study. Prior to joining Carnegie this year, uh, Dr. Usman was at the World Bank, initially as part of the prestigious Young Professionals Program, and later as a public sector specialist. She has also worked at the Blavatnik School at the University of Oxford for DFID uh, and for the Office of the National uh, Security Advisor in Nigeria. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Eka Ikpe, who is Deputy Director of the African Leadership Center and a senior lecturer in Development Economics in Africa at King's College, London. Uh, ECHA's research offers us a critical understanding of socioeconomic transformation processes 
which advances concept building that centers global South contexts. Uh, Dr. Ikbe's research has been published widely. Most recent papers include developmental post-conflict reconstruction in post-independence Nigeria, lessons from the Asian developmental states, published in the Journal of Peace Building and Development uh, last year, and thinking about developmental statehood, manufacturing, and international capital, the case of Ethiopia in the uh, Canadian Journal of Development Studies forthcoming. Uh, ECHA's research has supported the work of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, ECOWAS, the UK Ministry of Defense, the UK All Parliamentary Group on Africa, and the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So welcome uh, virtually to SAIS. Um, last but not least, uh, I'm delighted to welcome again uh, Dr. Raymond Gilpin, uh, who is is well known to us at Thais, uh, the Chief Economist and Head of Strategy Analysis and Research at UNDP. Prior to this position, uh, he was the Academic Dean at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C., and previously uh, Economics Director at the U.S. Institute of Peace, where he also chaired the Task Force on Business and Peace, managing the web-based international network for economics and conflict, and he taught resource management courses at the USIP Academy. He's had senior positions uh, at the Central Bank of Sierra Leone, African Development Bank, and the World Bank, and he was inducted into the Martin Luther King Collegium of Scholars at historic Morehouse College in Atlanta in 2015 for his work on economics and peace. Um, so as you can uh, tell, we uh, we're lucky to get our A list, and we have a, a powerhouse uh, panel, and we'll get right to it. Um, let me uh, begin with uh, Zainab, and then we'll uh, we'll move on from there. Zainab, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for those kind words and uh, for inviting me to this uh, discussion with other distinguished panelists, uh, Dr. Eka Ipe and Dr. Raymond uh, Gilpin. Um, so my uh, brief comments are really around um, Africa's post-pandemic economic recovery and the prospects for US-Africa relations. And I guess the main message that I want to pass across is that um, this pandemic and all that has happened actually provides a strategic opportunity to reorient US-Africa relations by uh, deploying vaccines, by facilitating collaborations between American pharmaceutical companies and African partners, uh, also by strengthening the capacity of medical professionals uh, towards a more longer term objective of building capacity on the continent, and also by having the United States play a leadership role around global coordination to help inject liquidity into African economies through the issuance of special drawing rights and the reallocation of the SDRs uh, uh, to, 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 to provide liquidity to the poorest countries. So that's kind of, uh, I guess, the four key things that I want to say. But before I say those four key things, I think a bit of context is useful here. Uh, indeed, as Peter uh, opened this panel um, with the statement that African countries were able to, uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, weather the initial shock, but eventually they could not escape the economic impacts. So the continent as a whole was plunged into recession last year, having uh, the, the economies in aggregate contract by around 2% according to the IMF. This was forced by a disruption of supply chains, a reduction of exports, especially for commodity exporters, a reduction of tourism and hospitality activities, and very, very importantly, by impact on small businesses, uh, where you have a lot of African economies having very large informal sectors. So they were affected by lockdowns and restrictions on mobility. With regards to oil exporters in particular, uh, they, they, they suffered heavily. So countries like Angola, like Gabon, and 
Nigeria has suffered only from a decline in commodity prices on which they depend for the vast majority of their exports, but also for government revenues. And so, you know, as well, Africa's largest economies, including Nigeria, but also South Africa, uh, went into recession, but they're now pulling out of it. Nevertheless, they have very high unemployment rates. So both Nigeria and South Africa, within the past couple of weeks, released uh, employment data for uh, Q4 2020. And both countries, interestingly, have at least a third of their labor force being unemployed, uh, which, is, which is really, really serious. Um, so that's kind of you know, the initial um, uh, economic impacts. Um, according to most projections by the IMF, but also by the African Development Bank, there's going to be a rebound in 2021. Uh, but despite the rebound in growth, there will be some, or there could be, could actually, this, it's a forecast, um, uh, some serious medium and longer term implications. So um, according to these projections, the continent is going to experience growth of around 3.4% in 2021, um, which is an improvement, but it's actually a worse outlook than the global average, which is around 5.5%. And it's actually worse than most, um, develop, most other developing and emerging regions of the world. So that's one thing. Uh, very importantly, um, there could be an increase in the number of people who fall into poverty in 2021. Up to maybe 40 million people could fall into poverty without mitigation measures to prevent this. So clearly, a strong economic recovery could happen, but and, and it could help stave off this, these serious medium and longer term implications. But this economic recovery really vitally depends on two key things, at least two key things. The first is access to vaccines, which is lagging the continent, and also strong fiscal policy response. So with regards to um, access to vaccines, it is rather unfortunate that African countries lag in the global distribution and rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, according to the World Health Organization in a statement they made, a few days ago, less than 2% of the total number of COVID-19 vaccines, vaccine doses administered globally have been in Africa. So with the exception of a country like Seychelles, which, is just, which, which has just you know, under 100,000 people, it has been able to vaccinate about 58% of its population because it has a small population and it has been able to secure you know, a significant uh, 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 amount of doses. And then a country like Morocco also, which has coverage of around 12%, the rollout across most African countries is very, very low. And vaccines that have been delivered through COVAX, for example, in countries like Rwanda, Ghana, and even Botswana have been depleted. Uh, so unfortunately, according to many, many projections, it could be until 2023 before um, you know, the continent is able to have sufficient vaccine access. And this, crucially, is going to have implications beyond just public health, beyond the health sector. It's going to affect people's mobility, the ability to travel, potentially even some supply chains could be disrupted. So very importantly also, the second aspect of this economic recovery is um, uh, the, a strong fiscal response. But this is hobbled by the fiscal and liquidity crisis that uh, some or many African countries are actually experiencing. This is because government revenue sources have dried up from declining um, uh, uh, you know, commodity uh, exports, um, but also because spending on healthcare is taking up a lot of uh, fiscal resources. So the African Development Bank estimates that African countries will need financing to the tune of around 154 billion dollars in 2021. Uh, but interestingly, this is just under 10% of the third stimulus package uh, that the US was able to deliver in March um, uh, this year. So 
this is this is the situation and then there's the, the issue of you know debt distress rising debt, debt distress not debt crisis per se but debt distress in quite a number of countries uh, where especially they, um, they, they, they they have their debt owed to private creditors in capital markets meaning that they are unable to uh, sign up for the debt suspension debt service suspension initiative um, coordinated by the World Bank so of particular concern here are countries like Ethiopia, like Ghana, Kenya, and Zambia. And then a country like Angola, which is heavily indebted to um, uh, Chinese uh, lenders. So just to finally conclude on those four important points that I made at the beginning, um, that I do believe that this is an important and momentous opportunity to repurpose and reposition US-Africa relations uh, to respond to the immediate priorities of helping with vaccine access and addressing liquidity constraints. But these are not just um, initiatives that have, that they will just have immediate resonance. They can help put African countries on a strong uh, post-pandemic uh, path to economic recovery. So these four things, just to reiterate them are, you know, in the first place, I think, I believe, President Joe Biden can immediately commit to supplying COVID-19 vaccines to African countries. Already there's a, you know, we're all, most of us are in the United States on this panel. Uh, there's a successful rollout, domestic rollout. I have already received the, my first uh, vaccine shot. Um, and according to most projections, the United States is going to have 75% uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine coverage by June this year in two months. So there's enough, there's more than enough vaccines uh, for the US government to remove export restrictions and actually provide, announce a goodwill donation to the African Union of 50 to 100 million vaccine doses. This goodwill gesture will be very important, although it's going to still come behind what the United States, what um, China and Russia have already done in terms of the the, the doses they have donated or provided to different African countries, but it will still be an important goodwill gesture. So that's number one. Number two is um, I think the United States government can support the production of vaccines and medicines in African countries. America, as we know, has a comparative advantage of world-class pharmaceutical companies, which were the ones, some of them led the innovation around COVID-19 vaccines. So these companies can collaborate with local partners to actually manufacture the vaccines in the immediate term, but in the, in the medium to long term, also ther therapeutics and diagnostics for COVID-19 to be able to scale up global production of COVID-19 vaccines. As, we're all, as many of us are aware, Johnson & Johnson is already partnering with Aspen Pharma in South Africa to supply the African Union with 400 million single shot uh, vaccines. This can be scaled up if it can be facilitated by the US government using entities like the International Development Finance Corporation uh, to provide guarantees and other de-risking financial instruments for these pharmaceutical companies to actually go to other countries like Nigeria, like Morocco, like uh, Senegal, like Mauritius, which have some uh, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity. Third is that the United States can play and should play a real leadership role around global coordination to inject liquidity into the global economy, especially for the poorest countries. Uh, this can be achieved through the issuance of uh, new special drawing rights and discussions are underway at the IMF for this to happen within the next one to two months. So around 650 billion special drawing rights, uh, which are a special currency issued by the IMF, can be issued, which can be converted to hard currency. But it's very, very important to know that even when these uh, special drawing rights are issued, the African continent is only gonna get 23 billion SDRs. So it will be important for the wealthy countries in the G7 to actually come together to voluntarily decide to reallocate some portion of their own SDRs to the poorest countries. But this requires global coordination. And this is 
an area where the United States can play an important role and show that you know it wants to repurpose its um, relations with the African continent. And the final point I'm going to make before I hand over to our moderator is that um, um, in the long term, there's the need to strengthen the capacity of medical workers and researchers in African countries. Again, this is an area where the United States has a comparative ad advantage. And this is, this is, let's not forget that the primary responsibility for upskilling medical professionals, for providing competitive working conditions, for providing functioning equipment and retaining top talent lies with African governments themselves. They have that responsibility. At the same time, the US can still help and should support this human capital development objective through exchange programs, especially with the large African diaspora here in the United States. You know, there are Ghanaians, Nigerians, Ethiopians in the US uh, uh, medical sector who can all be deployed. And they already sometimes in their own voluntary capacity uh, provide uh, you know, medical services to their home country. So they can all be deployed to help strengthen capacity in African countries. So with these four key initiatives, I think they provide an opportunity to really reposition US-Africa relations to help put Africa on a strong path towards a post-pandemic economic recovery. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's a very uh, excellent start for us and really puts us in a broad picture. I'm now going to uh, turn things over to Dr. Eka Ikpe. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, first, let me say thank you to SAIS for having me. Thanks to everyone that's joined us today. I'm very excited for the conversations that will take place. Um, so thanks also uh, to my panelists for being here and to the conversations and for the conversations I hope we will have. I think it's great to be following um, Dr. Usman there. She makes some points that I think um, I'll find myself speaking to, but you know, I listened to um, uh, His Excellency, uh, the Vice President of Shibajo earlier, and I think even there, um, there are points that I find myself speaking to the ambassadors after that as well, additional points that I think, you know, come out of this. And I think all of this speaks to how important um, this conversation is at this time. And something Dr. Osman said about the opportunities that uh, may be uh, presented. Um, I hope, uh, I, I think I will leave questions around that more than answers. It's something I often say to my students. Um, we, we, we come to class expecting to go away with answers, but generally I, I, I lay out more tricky questions for us to contend um, as we try to think and, and, uh, of the continent's progress and charge a way forward. Um, so I'm going to structure my brief opening remarks that really serve to center industrial development um, as being very significant to the continent's progress. I'm going to structure my uh, opening remarks in three parts. First, I want to highlight how the pandemic itself has shown the importance of industrial development. Um, after that, I want to reflect on a particular case of industrial development that's been supported by international capital, given that we're here talking about sort of U.S. relations with the continent in this new era, at least many of us are anticipating it will be a new era. Um, and then I want to address the interactions between something we've heard a lot of today, the African continental free trade area. We've also had reference to the African Development Bank um, and hegemonic finance. So talk you know, about linkages across um, those, those spheres. So first of all, um, the pandemic has shown the importance of industrial policy and manufacturing for resilience across the world. And you know, we saw this especially in the aftermath of um, the immediate aftermath of the crisis with production of medical de devices and health uh, supplies. Um, across the world in Africa, we saw this in Senegal, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and many other uh, contexts uh, as well. But what it has also shown us are the challenges of finance and technological dependence. And these have been highlighted by critical political economy scholars, Samir Amin and Claude Aki, amongst uh, many others. We've seen that efforts to develop vaccines in parts of the continent have been challenged by lim limited resources in Nigeria. This has been the case around resources to support human trials. I think it's interesting that I, uh, uh, last week or so, I read about how the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, um, there's a, a, a preprint a paper that's up, 
so pre peer reviewed uh, piece of research that is suggesting that um, that received 97% of public funding. And that gives us a sense of how significant that is to industrial policy itself. I think this is an argument that Mariano Mazzucato has made extensively around the sectors of pharmaceuticals as well as um, technology. So um, on technology dependence as well, I think a key point of note is how the WTO attempts to negotiate a waiver on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights um, that would enable widespread manufacture of the vaccines in global south context. This is led by South Africa and India has so far been rejected by the US, the UK, EU and Switzerland. And this is very telling in a, in a, in a moment of crisis where we all recognize how significant um, wider production of vaccines would be. Dr. Osman earlier, you know, uh, made the point very eloquently about how much more is needed and how long it's going to take us to get there because of the gap we have in terms of availability to vaccines. So I think what we see yet again is how Parts of the global south are confronted by their limited access to vaccines, while some global north counterparts secure vaccines to cover their population several times over. So despite claims that we've heard through um, out this period uh, about all uh, being, being in this all together, we're all in this together is a phrase we hear in the UK a lot, it's very clear that we are not all in this together. And that those that have had an advantage in terms of technological advancement, and very significantly, the semi-periphery context that have importantly renegotiated their relationships with the global economy have actually fared much better. I come now to my second point. Um, and you know, we heard this um, from Professor Lewis earlier, the flips that we had about this Africa rising narrative. And I want to uh, dwell a little bit on the flip side of this Africa rising narrative, which has been non net mineral and fuel resource exporters that have shown some resilience through crises. The uh, colleagues have mentioned the um, commodity uh, price uh, 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 dips and the crisis that accompanied that. Um, and they've shown this alongside improving levels of structural change. Examples here are Ethiopia, Cote d'Ivoire, and Rwanda. So my recent work reflects on one of Ethiopia's target sectors in this industrial policy agenda in leather production. And that's because of its large livestock resource of hides and skin. Now, there have been attempts to address limitations in finance and technology gaps through international capital, of course, from semi-periphery context. Um, and here we see how Chinese capital has been used to support investment and technological know-how to transition from exporting hides and skin and cross leather to very impressive performances in finished leather goods exports. But what do we see here? The focus on foreign investment and global uh, and the global market as well. So the focus on exports has actually appears to have deprioritized the domestic market and the role that the domestic market should normally naturally play in processes of structural transformation as a source of industrial demand. We've also seen um, that it has tended to cut out domestic private sector producers from this industrial transformation trajectory as well. So I think in the end, there are complex questions about who is participating in industrial development when we have a very central role for international capital, as well as how value is being articulated within that. I turn now to my final intervention. And one of my favorites, Samir Amin, has said that for socioeconomic transformation on the continent, we need to be centering domestic markets in order to contend the colonial legacy of being raw material suppliers to the global economy. Now, Africa's global exports constitute only 20% of manufacturers due to concentration in minerals and fuels vis-a-vis 45% of manufacturers as a proportion of intra-African exports. This reinforces the re-energized um, commitment to integration with the AFCFTA. Of course, linked to this is the long-standing concern about the infrastructural basis that will support this. We know that on the continent, for instance, uh, transport costs are some of the highest in the world. We have a, a figure of 7.7% of total export value, which is twice the global average. Now, the AFDB, the African Development Bank, has attempted to reprise the role that was, it was, that was set out for it within the Lagos Plan of Action in 1980 in its support to the AU Program for Infrastructural Development. The bank actually has origins and roots that can be seen as being anti-imperialist because it was only with the realization that actually global finance was controlled by hegemonic powers that in, early, in the early 1970s it was forced to open up to non-regional members 
Um, and what we've seen as a result of that is the dwindling control over time of regional members, especially in the aftermath of structural adjustment period. Linked to this, of course, have been concerns very recently about donor leverage and influence on the bank's actions. In 2020, we know the US government's rejection of the African Development Bank's governance processes in the midst of the pandemic, right? Uh, a rejection of its processes around addressing now dismissed allegations of misconduct um, that were put to the bank's president, uh, President uh, Adesino, forced a new and external process that actually served to uphold the outcomes of the internal process. A recent review of the, um, of the UK's engagement with the bank as well shows the UK's unilateral micromanagement of the work of the bank with its 2017 performance improvement plan um, that was also linked to its withholding of some of its payments in 2018. Interestingly, the commonality here is how um, the visions of these hegemons um, around what ought to be done is put forward as the norm, is put forward as benign and apolitical, and it's also unilateral vis-a-vis -vis the multilateralism of the bank's members itself. And so my final point on this is that you know, as the continent is charting a path, and I think this is a pivotal moment um, with the African continental free trade area, with all the issues that attend that, I think we can't deny um, that there are lots of issues that need to be uh, ironed out around that. But we see a, the charting of a path towards prioritizing value creation that is closer to home, a focus on domestic markets as well. And all of this is also connected to an attempt to break the continent's positioning in the global economy. What we see, of course, on the end of that is the need to address and negotiate these realities of technological and finance dependence on the global north, but of course, increasingly in semi-periphery contexts as well. And so questions around how that negotiation will take place are especially pertinent at this moment. Let me leave it there, and I look forward to the conversations that will take place um, as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you so much for that intervention. Uh, that We have quite a bit to, uh, to work from right now, but uh, we're going to also anticipate Dr. Gilpin's comments and then we'll, we'll move to a, uh, a broader discussion. Uh, Ray? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Peter, um, for um, hosting this important um, meeting. And uh, thanks also to uh, my fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Chiedo, um, for all the hard work in bringing us together to think about um, Africa's post-COVID um, economic trajectory in the context of U.S.-Africa relations. Uh, I think the central question, the central questions here are, first of all, um, how is Africa going to recover? Um, secondly, how will African countries work together to ensure that the recovery is meaningful? And thirdly, um, what role is there for um, development partners uh, and uh, broader stakeholders like the United States in this context? One of the great things about being the third panelist is that most of the ground has already been covered. So I'll just be nodding to um, Drs. Um, Eka and Zainab as I go along. But I want to, first of all, talk a little bit about um, the, where was Africa? Um, before the um, COVID pandemic. Um, we've talked quite a bit about um, the fact that we've seen, we, we, we had seen um, about a decade and a half of consistent growth um, in terms of GDP, productivity was ticking along pretty well. Um, but one thing about the uh, growth is that first, it was primarily extractive. And second, it was jobless growth. Because if you look across the African continent, um, jobs were scarce. People who were in the gig economy were expanding. The non-formal sector was the actual safety net. And so the, um, from the macro side, there were some problems with the kind of growth. The second issue is that if you look at um, social protection for the labor force before um, COVID, very few countries had contributory systems that covered the vast majority of the workers. 
what did this mean? It meant that um, business units, uh, industrial and manufacturing entities were pretty fragile uh, because they were not resilient, particularly when it came to um, labor market uh, shocks because there was no uh, protection. Thirdly, trade. The um, nature and the direction of trade were not um, really benefiting the continent as much as it could have. And because of the nature of the trade, African countries were particularly susceptible to shifts in, um, in commodity price, in global commodity prices. And so again, we saw coincidental to the pandemic, the um, dip in uh, prices in oil prices and which shocked African countries. So this is where we were, um, but on the positive side, African countries were investing a lot more in, on, on their, in their people, investing a lot more in infrastructure, and we're seeing a steady expansion of um, Africa's middle class and growing consumption, which um, boded well um, for um, continued economic development. Um, but then we had the pandemic. As of uh, today, um, about 118,000 African lives have been lost, um, under 4.4 million cases. But what has this meant? Um, on the continent, the epidemiological side of COVID has been, has been relatively muted, but the economic impacts have been pretty dire. Uh, we just released um, a report on the, on the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 across Africa. And it told us a number of things, which would not would be no-brainers. But two things I want to emphasize here is that in understanding the economic impacts, it's very helpful not to think about the continent as Africa. Because the oil-producing countries have a completely different dynamic than those who depend on tourism or agriculture or the small island um, um, economies. The diverse contexts matter greatly when we're thinking about how the continent as a whole would um, emerge, uh, would emerge from, from COVID. The second thing I'd like to uh, point about that at, at the uh, paper um, um, raised was the fact that um, trade is going to, um, trade um, patterns are going to change because of COVID. We're going to see a shift away from some of the traditional um, European um, um, trading and, and destinations to um, go but looking um, far east. But there's good news and bad news on the continent. In the near term, we, we, the, um, our, work seen, our, our work suggested there's going to be an increase in intra-African trade. But if steps are not taken to consolidate those gains, the models show that in the outer years, we're going to lose out to Asia, undermining the um, ethos for the Africa continental free trade area. And so this, all, all of these things um, give us um, um, reason to pause. Yes, we do have a lot of opportunities, but um, they are balanced by the um, challenges. So I'm quickly going to go through five areas where I think that we need to pay a little bit more attention um, when it comes to thinking about the recovery. Um, the first I have mentioned um, in passing that the regional market matters. Um, what COVID taught us is that global value chains could let Africa down on a dime. And therefore, one of the most important things is this, the, the anticipated increase, expansion of the Af single African market from under 3 trillion to 6.7 trillion in a few years, um, we should be finding ways to ensure that that regional market does not just serve GDP um, performance, but it serves each and every citizen on the continent. That's a transformation that is very important. And to make this happen, the focus has to be on regional complementarities. 
we have to ensure that you know African countries are producing what other African countries want to buy. And when they're thinking about export des destinations, they do likewise. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we need to rethink development financing and move away from the current centrality of aid. And now when we think about um, recovery, et cetera, we think about you know, how do we use aid, aid effectiveness. The whole development effectiveness literature has been colored by the aid effectiveness um, issues. African countries are not where they were 10, 15 years ago. Um, a lot of um, African, uh, a lot more African countries than we would care to um, think are not low income anymore. Africa has uh, um, a sizable amount of middle income countries. Um, for example, just um, last month, um, Ghana uh, was, was, was able to um, get a, um, a significant um, bond, um, $3 billion, four years, zero coupon bond to refinance some of its debt and also help it with the economic transformation. Aid is not going to be able to do that for African countries. And so as we think about how we um, channel and enable the financing for development, we have to think about the Africa of tomorrow and not the Africa of yesterday where almost everybody wanted aid. These days, a lot of countries require the sort of um, creative financing um, and market defying um, approaches to aid that um, to um, financing that um, Ghana showed us um, as possible. Third thing is that we have to reevaluate Africa's place in global value chains. Last year's World Development Report um, showed that if we have a 1% increase in global value chain participation, it could boost per capita growth levels by more than 1%. So without doing, um, without, um, um, you know, doing new things, just re-engineering um, global's place, renegotiating Africa's place in global value chains, um, looking at manufacturers, looking at intermediate goods, could itself be a boost, not just to sustain economic growth trajectories, but to deliver the economic development dividends that has been lacking um, for quite a while. Fourth thing that we, I want to talk about is equity and inclusion. Um, women and, and a lot, there's been a lot of research around COVID socioeconomic um, impact. Women are disproportionately um, disadvantaged. Um, in business, in access to capital, in land titling, all the things that make entrepreneurship possible um, traditionally, a lot of, and also um, from a legal and regulatory perspective, um, a fair proportion of women are disadvantaged. I tell people that it's like going out to play a football match with only half of your team. Women constitute half of Africa's population, so why are they being left out? The second part of the inclusion um, issue is the non-formal economy. We always discuss it as this strange thing that is centuries um, behind the times, when in actual fact, uh, the market fundamentals in Africa's non-formal economy are a lot more, a lot stronger than in the formal economy that's rife with a lot of um, challenges and um, corruption and inefficiencies. Um, and the last thing is that the economic transformation has to be grounded in technology. Uh, we're not, we need to go beyond trying to answer um, development questions to solving problems uh, over the long term. Whether you're thinking about energy or agriculture or education or health, um, in Africa, um, the uh, technology dimension, not just, not just this digitalization, um, i.e. Um, cell phone penetration, et cetera. No, how do we use um, technology to solve problems that have endured for um, decades? And I think that is very important. And so partners like the US, I'll just read these very quickly in the interest of time. I think first of all, 
I know it's a big continent. Um, dealing with 55 different entities is challenging. But we should move away from having an Africa strategy. That's not helpful because the continent is so diverse and people are, countries are at different levels when it comes to um, economic um, growth and development. So we need more contextualized uh, policy approaches. Second, um, we should have a more balanced leveraging of all instruments of US national power. Um, when we think about um, the complexity of the challenges that African countries face, um, the intertwining of the governance, the security, etc., just having a development project or development initiative somewhere doesn't get you there. There has to be a leveraging and a coordination of all, of, of all um, instruments of national power. Third, um, we should go beyond um, just identifying a new um, development initiatives to supporting Africa um, to address the um, outflows of um, illicit, or illicit financing from the continent. Um, last year, the UNCTAD um, report put the, um, num put the number at about $90 billion a year. Okay, we might quibble about whether or not that number is representative or is, or is accurate. But the reality is that uh, bad contracting and um, uh, lack of oversight of, the, of, of these natural resource contracting is costing African countries a significant amount every year. And what does this mean? It, just, it doesn't mean any, anything more than holding the companies to the same standard that they adhere to on the New York Stock Exchange. Why should they behave differently just because they are doing business in Africa? Um, four, um, we should take Africa's infrastructure gaps seriously. Um, you look at a lot of the um, financing and funding that's going to investments in Africa, very little is going the way of infrastructure. And that's an important gap that Africa needs to um, fill if it's going to realize the benefits of the Africa Continental Free Trade um, Area Agreement, and if it's going to um, consolidate um, the, some of the gains of the past um, decade and a half and rebuild um, post-COVID post um, effectively. And finally, I think that um, this has been said, you know, numerous times by uh, a number of people that linking how we think about a U.S. Africa engagement to political cycles is not really helpful. We need a longer time horizon to plan for not just the investments but how we recalibrate as these investments begin to yield um, dividends. And there's a lot of historical um, um, evidence to um, suggest that a more medium to longer term engagement strategy um, would help um, immensely. So I'll stop here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Great. Thanks to each of you. Um, a couple of things have struck me uh, in this conversation already. Uh, on the one hand, there uh, has been an abundance of thoughtful analysis uh, and empirical work on changing African economies within the last you know, decade. Uh, and there's been an evolution in the debate and the discussion, which I'll talk about uh, momentarily. But it also strikes me, um, given the context of the conference, that uh, the U.S. has been almost absent from this discussion and debate uh, and, and analytical work for uh, at least five years. Um, certainly not in any significant part, uh, in any significant way part of the discussion uh, over the last four years. And one could even go back a bit further. Uh, and so while there have been quite a number of uh, perceptive 
uh, analysts and institutions working on the economic challenges of the region, uh, the U.S. has not been substantially part of the conversation. Um, and I think our three presentations this afternoon uh, personify that and also uh, elucidate what some of the important current thinking is on, on key uh, economic issues. The other thing to just emphasize about how the conversation has moved on, no surprise to any of our panelists, but um, worth underscoring, is the, the things that we're not talking about. We're not talking about US-China head-to-head competition um, and whether China is good or bad or indifferent. We're not talking about uh, yet another round of exhortation about uh, liberalization or Washington consensus policies. We're not talking about overly exuberant projections uh, arising from, um, you know, or emanating from the Africa rising uh, uh, analysis in the early 2000s when growth was taking off. And we're not mired in a kind of uh, Afro-pessimism uh, that emphasizes historical and structural uh, constraints. So there's a set of poss there's a sense of possibility. There's a sense of resilience. There's a sense of uh, both options and challenges out there. And I'm excited by these various uh, facets of the conversation uh, in thinking about where the continent is going, where different economies and subsectors and subregions in the continent are going. As uh, uh, everybody has mentioned, it's not one economy and there are resource producers and there are resource poor countries and there are countries that have larger internal markets, countries which may not be viable for developing internal markets, countries with different trade linkages and so forth. So we need to be thinking about that. So I guess what I want to uh, pose are uh, a couple of uh, general questions to get the conversation started. One is there, there is no question, uh, and everybody uh, has recognized this and talked about it, there's no question that after the lost decades of the 1980s and the 1990s, the 2000s were a new growth episode. Um, there were a lot of factors that went into that, commodity super cycle, more attention from East Asia, and new international interlocutors, um, debt consolidation, debt workouts, uh, some governance changes, and so forth. But there was a growth episode that more or less plateaued in, in 2015. So I'd, I'd first like to ask everybody a simple question, which is what do you see as the benefits or the legacy of that growth episode? What, what, are, we, what, what are we left with now in terms of, of the, the new dispensation or the new conditions uh, after almost 20 years of, uh, of growth? And the flip side of that, of course, are the challenges. Uh, jobless growth, problems of structural transformation, need for domestic manufacturing capacity. Everybody has mentioned these. And I'd like us to think about what are the binding constraints on moving forward with that uh, agenda. I'm particularly excited by the discussion, both directly and tangentially, about um, the importance of returning to a kind of industrial policy uh, and the importance of uh, a more activist and strategic state presence uh, or government presence in managing the process. So what do you see as the, the sort of uh, legacy or benefits of growth? What do you see as the binding constraints? And then of course, the third question, which people have addressed, but I wanna sort of jump back into it is, um, given the constraints of uh, inequalities of uh, the global economy, uh, given the inevitable and um, indisputable differences in interests of North and South. Nonetheless, uh, the US would like to re-engage, I think, in more constructive ways with the continent. What are the opportunities for us in terms of uh, policy? So I realize those are small questions, not much there, 
but um, benefits of growth, binding constraints, and maybe a couple of uh, sort of key priorities for U.S. policy. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Dr. Usman. Okay, I will attempt to tackle these very trivial questions. Small very questions very quickly, right. <laughs> Uh, so starting with the benefits of the growth episode of the 2000s, which as you rightly mentioned, began to plateau from around 2015 and then, you know, was also um, really <laughs> disrupted by uh, the pandemic. Um, so, so maybe it's important to try to get a better sense of what actually drove that growth across uh, many countries. Uh, definitely, we don't want to generalize and say, you know, Africa is one continent, it is not. And the experiences of different regions and uh, different kinds of countries all vary. Um, so, a key aspect of that growth was just um, investment flows from new partners, mainly China, but also India, Brazil, and other emerging economies around that time, which kind of helped to really propel these economies. And in some of my work, what I actually argue is that even previous frameworks, analytical frameworks like resource curse theories, which had argued for a long time that resource rich countries would be perpetually stuck in this low growth trap. The reality of many African countries at that time completely defied those projections and those postulations. Um, so just understanding the drivers of that growth, which for the most part had to do with the commodity boom, whether non-renewable whether renewable, non -renewable resources like oil and mineral exports or also agricultural produce, that helped to drive the growth. But also, the other thing was that many countries had emerged out of war and conflict at the time, so there was pent of demand which helped to drive the growth at the time. And then finally, um, many countries embarked, it was just a period, there was a period of relative stability, countries embarked on significant economic reforms um, at the time. And a lot of those reforms were liberal reforms, you know, uh, privatizing, um, you know, liberalizing various sectors, telecoms, uh, services sectors, financial services, and the likes. Um, but then that plateaued because, as we've discussed on the panel already, my colleagues have already mentioned this, the quality of the growth itself was quite suspect. It was largely driven by commodities. Uh, the growth itself was not associated with structural transformation that we've seen in other parts of the world, particularly Asia. You know, when you look at data for many countries, manufacturing value added did not actually increase as a share of GDP. I mean, there's some new analysis showing that actually the employment share of manufacturing increased a little within those 20 years compared to the 1980s and the 1990s. But basically, there was no manufacturing, uh, 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 there was no manufacturing boom, there was no industrialization per se. Um, so, but, but nevertheless, there were still benefits because with growth, you know, there was rising incomes to a certain degree. And in some countries, like, Tanzania, like Ghana, like Rwanda, like Ethiopia, there was some poverty reduction. When you look at the numbers, poverty actually reduced in some of those countries, but probably not in other countries, especially oil, the main oil exporters, Nigeria and Angola, we did not quite see a significant decline in poverty. The one other benefit I'm gonna mention is that it also helped to kind of rekindle some kind of optimism around African countries and African economies, among African them, Africans themselves, but also, um, you know, Africa's own external partners. Whereas in the 1990s, it was just a story of doom and gloom, you know, there was all this talk about Africa's lost decade, you know, 
know, and all of those things. The, the 2000s were somewhat optimistic. And unfortunately, I think the discourse then moved to the extreme where there was a small Africa rising. Africa is suddenly, you know, becoming Dubai or Singapore or whatever. African countries were becoming like that, which was not quite the case. So those were some of the benefits that actually allowed countries, you know, like Ghana, like Nigeria, like Zambia, and quite a number of others that have been able to tap into capital markets. It's partly because of that optimism, the improvement of the economic fundamentals that helped them. Uh, clearly, the challenges I've already mentioned, you know, the quality of the growth itself, the absence of manufacturing, uh, based industrialization. And for finally, for US Africa policy or US Africa relations, then within this context, you know, it is really to try to find areas where interests align. Because the reality is, when it comes to foreign policy, nations will act in their own interest. It's all good and fine for African countries to have this wish list of what, what they want to achieve, which is absolutely, absolutely legitimate and valid, and they should pursue that. Uh, but also realizing that external partners will pick and choose what works in their own interest. So just being a bit more realistic as to what it is the United States can help with. And for me personally, the way I see it, you know, identifying areas where the U.S. has comparative advantage and where it's much easier to facilitate a discussion around where partnerships can be forged. For example, pharmaceuticals, for example, uh, production and manufacturing of pharmaceuticals in African countries, which can help create jobs, which can help add value, but which can also help create forward and backward linkages to other, to the rest of the economy, right? I think that is one important area that I think the United States can help, you know, uh, Africa uh, towards a post-pandemic recovery, but also to forge stronger U.S.-Africa relations. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Thank you. Thanks very much to that. Let me connect to one of the points um, uh, Dr. Osman mentioned there. I think for me, a big element that has, you know, when, when we, the, the, the first question you asked about, you know, this growth episode, what, what is left from that? And I think absolutely this sense of promise and what is possible. And I think in spite of the, you know, the highs and the lows, that has remained. And I think that has remained because there's a more complex way of thinking about the continent. It's not that we didn't have these highs and lows previously, it's that, you know, we have emerged into a space where we recognize it's a complex context. Um, and, you know, there are particular reasonings around that. I think even recognizing that you have a, a range of, um, uh, of realities for resource-rich resource economies and, you know, those who are not uh, net resource exporters. So, as I mentioned, I think, you know, Africa rising, of course, that benefited a lot, the, the big, especially the big resource exporters, but we saw a different kind of resilience as well as part of that. Those who sort of survived those dips really impressively, and I mentioned Ethiopia, Rwanda, you know, these were very, you know, because the, the, the big economies were in recession while these ones were ticking along. Um, and I think Dr. Osman mentioned, you know, in Ethiopia, you did have major reductions in poverty alongside um, this reality as well. Um, so I think that, you know, this very positive picture that I would argue has remained, I see it even in this COVID era, this COVID period, that dismissal that used to happen, uh, you know, with the continent, is not in the same vein. It's not in the same way. Of course, I think many have argued that during the pandemic, ways to try and explain away um, the resilience that we're seeing as well uh, you, we, were very uh, uh, um, prominent um, in, in the debate. But I think that's a big element that has carried on. Um, I think also a break with the global north-south narrative. I think it remains. It is important. I think that core periphery dynamic, we keep coming back to it because it's there. You know, I think we're not making it up. It's there. But again, a more complicated engagement with that. We see uh, you know, so-called semi-periphery context, what many have referenced as engagement with the East, but not just, you know, there, the BRICS, the Mint, however, you know, and also inclusion of African economies in those narratives. So I think on the global state, this bigger place for large African economies, of course, that has also meant 
uh, again, more recognition of diversity of the continent itself. You know, a lot of, and I, this question came up in the earlier conversation, we're excited, I'm certainly excited about AFCFTA, but a big question there is the equitable benefit that will accompany that. Um, also the influence of, of these very big partners. And that is becoming clearer and clearer. And I think that's really linked also to this, uh, to, to the, the realities of the uh, growth episode um, uh, that we saw. I think a changing engagement with infrastructure, in spite of the fact that there are still gaps, recognition that this is essential in ways that, you know, we, we didn't hear these, these conversations before. You made a point, Professor Lewis, about, um, uh, you know, industrial policy. Again, this is a theme that was, we all thought was dead and buried, really. Um, but now it's finding its way in mainstream discourses. You think of the, the World Bank, new structural economics. So I think I would say still, uh, tinged with liberalism in those spheres, but we're seeing the prominence around industrial policy that we haven't seen um, in a very, very long time. For me, what it also does is connect this period to the post-independence period. I think it's important to locate it along a trajectory and helping us see that the continent changes over time, that a range of factors you know, mean that we find ourselves in diff different periods, different episodes. So even this is an episode along a trajectory. And I think it's important to bear that in mind because the challenge with structural adjustment and all of that was that became how to define Africa. There was nothing that existed before that and nothing that existed af after that. And it, it, it's, it's too simplistic, it's too reductionist. So I think some complexity is what we're seeing in this period that is lasting. Um, even, you know, talking about COVID, it, again, as you said, it's not, it's not, oh, forget it, it's all the end, you know, it's linked to that, that, that this more complex view of things. I think manufacturing is linked to industrial policy too. Yes, there are gaps in manufacturing value added. I think we can't deny that, but there have been improvements more than we've also seen in a very long time, even in resource exporters as well. So diversity, I think of Nigeria as a space I know well, you know, an economy that's becoming more and more diverse in spite of the fact that it is still, you know, has a petroleum economy that, you know, is still very central to everything. Explosion of services is a key element, I think, in all of these debates and this discourse, this discourse about structural change. Um, yeah, and those of us, like me, who harp on about industrial development are being challenged by those that say, maybe we can leapfrog that. I don't believe we can. But you know, let's have a more complicated conversation about services, the place of services, their role in a structural transformation of some sort. I think this point came up with sort of technology um, as well. And for me, What's important in that is, and I come now to my constraints uh, point, is dependence. You know, in spite of all these shifts and movements, I think, you know, we need to, and I think technology is especially a space that actually we can unpack and have this conversation. It's important for us to deploy all of this, but who owns that? Who runs this technology? What, where is the space for ownership um, of actors on the continent itself? We can't be recipients and consumers deploying these? How do we get into those spaces where we control uh, uh, some of these very important tools? I think that's really, really key and very significant in the, in the conversations we're having. For me, that's something that endures. So, you know, we have this expansion of actors. We move from global north to south, but now we hear from semi-periphery context, is this a replication of you know, this dependency story again. Are we having a, what, the conversations we had about global north context vis-a-vis -vis African economies, we're having them again about China and African economies. And I think this is something that needs to be disrupted. You know, it's, it's, in some spaces, it's almost like just replace the so-called core economy where we're reflecting on. And that then I think we need to, we need to challenge. Um, it's a space that needs, you know, a lot of work. For me, I've referenced the technology questions here. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm all for these engagements, these interactions, but even I think with the global value chain arguments being positioned um, at the behest of international capital where lead firms are based outside of the continent will not, I mean, I think we will keep coming back to mm -hmm. these conversations mm -hmm. and questions. Okay. Yes, we have to engage and interact. It is a global economy, but we have to ha have more complicated conversations about where lead, firm are lead right. firms are based, about how value is articulated as well. We can't just join in. Uh, I mean, we can do that as part of a trajectory, but there must be a bigger objective, mm -hmm. a bigger goal. Where are we headed? You know, where is it, where is it going? I think this is a key point. Um, I'm, to I'm going to intervene a little bit just because we have like three minutes Please left. Please go on, yes, yes. Let me leave it. Very <laughs> energetic and, and thoughtful. Um, I'm going to give uh, Dr. Gilpin uh, the sort of last space and I, I'm going to slot in 
you, you can you addressed a lot of this stuff in your remarks anyway, but I'm also going to slot in a question which I think uh, pertains directly to you that showed up in the Q and A, which is uh, how are the worsening conflicts in some regions, the Sahel, Horn of Africa, Mozambique, how are they influencing the potential for recovery? So um, you could you could take that or any part of this sort of omnibus question that we threw out. You know, uh, thank you so much, and um, a lot of richness um, around uh, the around the virtual table. Um, on the um, security and governance side, uh, let me speak to both. Um, you know, where these begin to deteriorate, we always see a reversal of development. Not a stopping of development, a reversal of development. Economies, societies move backwards. And so that is why it's very important for us to have mechanisms um, continent-wide to be able to address these, um, because without those um, issues being addressed, we'll continue, we will not only have the countries or the regions held back, but the continent as a whole. Um, just very quickly on um, looking ahead and um, stories from the, um, to, from the 2000s. Yes, we have a lot of um, challenges, but I do think that we do have opportunities. And these opportunities, we must try not to intellectually pre-cook them. Um, because the economies are vibrant beyond our understanding and our, our control. And I think that we should now seize this opportunity to redefine um, relationships, both trading and development relationships within the continent and outside the, the continent. We should also see the opportunity to focus on models of growth that deliver not just GDP, um, um, good GDP figures, but deliver development um, dividends. We could use this, the SDGs as, as, as a framework or the um, Africa 2063 also as, 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 as a framework. But we should have, the, the question is what is our goal? And I think the Africa we want 2063 could, could, could be used, used as a framework. Let me finally, very quickly, Peter, um, just put a, a little bit of a caveat on this industrial, um, industrialization um, issue. Um, you know, wherever we have seen worldwide this industrial um, strategy planned, it's always not as effective as it is where we allow the power and the force of entrepreneurship to drive change. And here is where we need to find out how do we help those who are wealth and value creators to be able to do this. And we have to look beyond the continent because we're now in a globalized value chain. We cannot assume that away. And that I think is, is um, a key question for us as we uh, move forward. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, yes, well, I think we could do another conference on uh, industrial policy and talk about, because it, it's a phrase that is um, resurgent um, and like so many phrases in any of our debates, uh, poorly understood with different meanings and, and different constructions. And I, I think probably if we had another uh, hour or half hour with this group, we could come to, a, a, I think, a reasonable consensus about it. But um, I'm glad we at least put this on the table. And uh, by way of uh, conclusion, I'll just say, first of all, thank you for an exceptional uh, panel. You know, conferences, whether they're uh, in the room or virtual, have a certain rhythm and people get tired as the day wears on. And I love it when the final panel is just this burst of energy uh, and there's a lot of good stuff on the table and, and you, we all get revived. So that's excellent. And I appreciate uh, everybody's uh, participation. Um, more generally, we've had three, con we've had three panels today. Uh, as well as the very thoughtful uh, and far-reaching comments of the Vice President of Nigeria. And we've engaged with uh, security issues, governance issues, and uh, economic issues. And in each panel, we've tried to uh, balance both uh, an up-to-date analysis 
of the current state of play, the current terrain, the uh, ongoing or emerging challenges in security, in democratization or governance, in uh, economic change uh, and economic uh, uh, growth. Uh, we've tried to balance an appreciation of sort of circumstances on the ground with a, uh, a thought uh, about US policy options. Um, again, I, I think, uh, I, I'm not alone probably in the participants in this conference, but certainly speaking as an American based in Washington, uh, the new president says America is back, which I realize around the world may not sound as good to everybody equally, but um, certainly uh, the idea of a more uh, thoughtful, humane, uh, and engaged United States on uh, issues of, of common interest, uh, I think has its appeal. Um, but then the question is engaged in what way, engaged on what, and uh, I, what I've heard in every panel and every set of remarks is uh, the idea of long-term planning, long-term strategic analysis and thought as the uh, essential foundation for US policy. Uh, and the idea of having a new initiative, a new signature uh, program uh, for each administration uh, or for every four year term uh, is clearly not the, the path that we want to be uh, walking uh, if we're gonna have uh, a mutually beneficial complementary uh, relationship. There's also obviously baggage from the past. There's obviously national interests and inequities, but there's also the possibility for some very constructive, forward-looking cooperation. Uh, and in such areas as uh, public health, pharmaceutical development, and even pharmaceutical manufacturing, uh, agriculture, uh, industry, uh, governance, uh, and so forth. Um, we are far, far uh, past the time when the U.S. is going to be able to come in with any capacity or credibility uh, as, a, as, as a power that's going to deliver answers in any of these areas. Uh, but we certainly do have both resources and experience uh, and uh, intellectual grounding uh, which enables us to be part of a conversation with countries and uh, civic resources around the world. And so hopefully uh, the new administration will think about, if not a reset in our relations with Africa, how to move forward in a constructive way uh, to collectively and cooperatively address uh, issues that uh, the continent is uh, taking into consideration, the continent is taking initiative to resolve. So with that reflection, I will uh, thank Professor Nwankwar uh, and Elor and Kere Uwem. I am going to profusely thank our events team and our IT team, uh, Chazelle Povedano, uh, the student uh, assistant and student uh, uh, collaborator on this program. Um, I'm going to thank uh, our panelists, um, Dr. Usman, Dr. Ikpe, Dr. Gilpin, and uh, our previous speakers. And I wish everybody uh, a good afternoon. Thanks. Thank you.